the scene cuts to a stakeout in the ghetto of West Baltimore. We see an SUV framed, a medium long shot. Again, this is you know a, a cut in of that very same scene. Use my goddamn car to show for that dusty bitch. So in the midst of the corner scene, you we actually see the, we, we see the means by which people end up in court, out. which is the stakeout. And, you know, what, one of the editing strategies that is frequent to this is the way in which uh, kind of unmotivated, motivated relationships, but non-causal, specifically causal relationships are part of the editing strategy. So we can see you know, That's the, the, the uh, thematic of futility, you would have seen. because he gonna get we will see people arrested, but we know that they're not going to be because somebody will be sitting in a car, courtroom intimidated. I am waiting to drop. Take your car when it's deep in the block. I don't want no foot chase. Um, That's also part of the anti-police drama uh, motivation of the series is that police work is not heroic. Police work does not do what it pretends to do. There are bigger social problems, and those social problems are not at all addressed by the kind of limited scope of, of policing. Uh, some of these scenes asserts the futilities of the arrest and mitigates the apparent authority of those involved in the legal system. After the acquittal, the arresting officer declaims, you think I give a fuck? And then, and when summoned to Judge Fallon's office, McNulty responds to the judge's questioning of why he cares about when the case, why he cares about the case when it is not his by asserting, who says I do? But the point is that McNulty, kind of the most visible and heroic presence, if there is one, in the drama, is, uh, does care, and it's one of the keys to his drama. So, uh, Subsequently, we get to see police work, and it's, what we find is that, for the most part, it's intensely bureaucratic. Right, it's like 24-7 for Dope and Co. That's just the towers. So the low rises, right the avenue corners, they're all his, too. How do you know this? Informing the system. Everybody knows. Define everybody. Right, everybody on the west side. The Barksdale and Bell, a little new power. I mean, they drop 10 or 12 bodies in as many months. Beat three cases in court doing the same thing they just did to you. Well, who's working on In the department? Nobody, really. Well, I mean, we're a little busy doing street rips, you know? Community policing and all that. So if it's not your case, why do you care? Well, who said I did? And this is a quick cut to the police headquarters and, you know, to look at the kind of bureaucratic insularity within the modernist framing of the building uh, and the way in which we go to a office that could be really anywhere, any under-equipped kind of bureaucracy in the United States, uh, either public or low-end private. And again, that's part of Simon's general emphasis is the way in which police work, work has been really, uh, reduced to irrelevance and the way in which uh, bureaucratic function becomes the primary mode of uh, of operation. This general composition strat compositional strategy of defining Baltimore as a series of related but discontinuous spaces is one, that is one that is definitional for season one. But as we move forward in the various episodes that comprise the season, we can see the way in which this editing strategy is not only about relative physical isolation among the various social spheres of the city, it is also a means of showing the extent to which the goings-on in each sphere are comparable and distinct from those in the other. As Griggs continues to peck away at the typewriter we just saw, the scene shifts abruptly without transition, without transition to a point-of-view shot from inside a point, an SUV driven by Weebay, who drives D'Angelo, who was just a defendant in the trial, through the nighttime streets of West Baltimore. The inside-the-truck perspective makes the streets a context for, but not the subject of, the shot. Similarly, the relationship between Kima and these men is through the drug trade, but not a matter of absolute proximity. 
the building that houses the narcotics division, the bureaucrat cubicle, and the vehicle in which these men drive are parts of distinct but related worlds. Wibe, who supplies the violence for his gang, is to his system. Ms. Kima, who tracks and apprehends drug dealers, is to hers. Both are competent and effective tools of their own bosses, but each is wedged into his or her position and cannot and would not choose to get up. The connection between these worlds is a matter of mutual obligation. Wibe and D'Angelo, and indeed Barksdale and Bell, are all wealthier than Greg's, the police officer, and the other police officers, lower, and lower in class by some definitions. They operate an empire that relies on the exploitation of the truly down and up, frequent regions that other African Americans of their relative wealth rarely go, like the housing projects, and exhibit behaviors that make them social pariahs, murder and intimidation, substance abuse. The scene it, D'Angelo and Weebe in the SUV reveals, the scene of D'Angelo and Weebe in the SUV reveals this paradox. The vehicle is of a late model, the driver and passenger are well-dressed, Yet the discussion of witness intimidation and fear of police surveillance situates them outside of the behavior and mores that fit their economic status. But Simon's broader point is about class and not wealth per se, so that Barksdale's gang, gang is defined not by the copious amounts of cash it possesses, which runs into the millions, but by the way it fits the spaces and conventions of middle class and respectable life in the U.S. city, which is to say, not at all. Arguably, the entire apparatus of cops, administrators, judges, equipment, and so on exist because Barksdale and Bell see their fortune as predicated on the providing of illicit substances to a captive clientele. If these drugs were not illegal, then there would be no need for the gang. Its way of doing business would be utterly unnecessary. There would be no enforcers, no inter-gang battles for turf, no runners, no quarter boys, which is exactly the system that D'Angelo was articulating when he entered the uh, low-rise courtyards in the first shot that I showed you. <coughs> but because heroin and cocaine are against the law, the price goes up. There's a need to insulate the trade from law enforcement officials. And even as the, and the prices continues to go up, even as the quality may go down. And because Barksdale and Bell exist, people like Greg's, Daniels, Greg's and Daniels are consumed, police officers are consumed with their capture, and the city must hire more and more law enforcement officials to pursue them. Because drugs are illegal, they become not just a commodity like any other, they define a lifestyle. This is not to say they articulate the process by which West Baltimore became devoid of lawful work and capital. Rather, they can take root here and make that region captain as a result, captive as a result of the absence of other means of generating work and cash. And their status is outside of law and subject to more ordinary means of commerce. William Julius Wilson talks about this phenomenon in a study, landmark study, when work disappears, which was actually very influential for David Simon as he was putting this show together. Writes Wilson, the decline of legitimate employment opportunities among inner city residents increased the incentive to sell drugs. The presence of high level of drug activity in a neighborhood is indicative of problems of social organization. High rates of joblessness trigger other problems in the neighborhood that adversely affect social organizations, including drug trafficking, crime, crime and gang violence. Wilson goes on to trace the various types of drugs that were popular at a given moment, asserting that heroin, the drug of choice in the wire, made a comeback in the mid-1990s. He also notes the impact of the prevalence of the drug trade on those who are not explicitly involved in that trade, as its climate of lawlessness, lawlessness and role in increasing gun violence tends to broadly disrupt the social organization of these already disrupted places. The wire makes the drug trade definitional for the space of the underclass. The way in which it affixes to the poverty of the housing projects that takes root there appears organic. What seems to be at stake here is a broader vision of social isolation. If we look at the editing strategies of the season, we can see the ghetto as a sequence of contiguous spaces, and the places of middle class existence are relative fortresses with few exceptions. In this telling, then, the job of the surveillance state is to enforce the borders of the ghetto. Indeed, it is intriguing that as a matter of textual emphasis, there are breaks within scenes where the realist visual emphases of the series gives way to a bleached out shot from a perspective of a surveillance camera. This occurs mostly within institutional settings, the courthouse camera, the L 